So good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Paul's. And today we are going to be looking at Celtic spiritualities. It's a great honor to share uh, a little bit of my own heritage uh, from Ireland and to talk about the Celtic uh, tradition in religion and uh, how that uh, shaped Christianity and still does. And it, it offers in some ways, a, a, as we will discover, an alternative to um, much of mainstream Christianity uh, today. So part of what we're gonna try and do is um, cover in about um, 30 to 40 minutes, a little bit of the background to this. I've got a presentation, we'll have some questions at the end, and then I have to run and get ready for the 11 o'clock uh, service. Uh, you all understand that. So. If you could just make sure that you're muted, um, that would help. And then I'm going to uh, begin to share the screen. And basically I have a presentation and then we can open it up for questions um, near the end of uh, the presentation. So I call this uh, Celtic spir spiritualities. And uh, uh, what I'm what I'm trying to do is to cover from about the fifth century to about the ninth century, which is kind of that, that kind of golden age of, of Celtic spirituality and art and tradition, uh, storytelling, uh, which uh, then poured in and influenced the medieval period. And many of the medieval writings, they, they attached, they found great inspiration from the stories of like Brendan, the navigator who was an Irish saint we'll hear about. And so the medieval period um, also uh, kind of influenced the way we think about uh, the Celtic church. So let me talk a little bit about the Celtic world because many, many people are uh, have the misunderstanding that uh, to be Celtic means you live in Wales or Scotland or Ireland or Brittany. But the actual, the roots of the Celtic tribes came from um, way into Asia and uh, Eastern Europe. And there were migrations of different people um, over something like 2000 years that came in through um, across the Alps, in through France, then Spain, and from Spain going up to Britain and to, to uh, Ireland. So uh, the DNA of many people in, in Ireland and the UK have their origins in places like Turkey. Um, and that's a, a kind of su surprise for a whole lot of people. So we, we know the emergence of Celtic culture 2000 BCE, which grew alongside Greek and Roman culture. The difference being Celtic culture was nomadic and tribal. The Celts did not uh, live in cities. And that's going to be a, when we come to how evangelism, how the, there was a difference in how the Celtic church organized itself and if it evangelized Christianity. Julius Caesar, um, part of uh, him being a historian, he identifies this Celtic tribe called the Keltoi in Northern Turkey. And they were uh, kind of, they were regarded by uh, the Romans as warmongering, uh, which is a bit like the pot calling the kettle black. Um, and uh, from about the fourth century BCE, they, they cross the Alps, they move into Italy, and they were always kind of in conflict with Imperial Rome. Uh, they actually, uh, they defeated the Romans at the Battle of Allia in 387 BC, and they sacked Rome. And this is an important, um, uh, important point I want to make, because those of us who are familiar with the New Testament, there is a kind of underlying um, theme of, of anti-imperial Rome from the Jewish tradition, as well as the Celtic tradition. And the Romans uh, hated and despised both the Jews and the, and the Celts because they rose up, again. they had the audacity to rise up uh, against them. So Paul's letter to the Galatians, the Galatians was another uh, name for the Celts. Uh, so when Paul is writing to the church in Galatia, he's writing primar primarily to this Celtic tribal group, and he's very close to them. 
Uh, they take care of him when he is sick one time. And he, he kind of chastises them in his letter because they're trying to, they're trying to kind of up their resume and be respectable people. And he said, oh, come on, you, should, you guys should know better. Um, it's it's okay and it's okay to be inclusive in this in this uh, experience of being in Christ. Um, and we see this. Some of you may be familiar. Certainly, George would be familiar with a lot of statuary around uh, the first couple of centuries, where uh, the Celts are depicted as uh, nasty, bearded, kind of dwarf-like people and the Romans are these big, strong, muscular guys. So you see the kind of hatred and animosity between the Romans and the Celts in, in various forms of art. When we look at what's different about how Rome and Christianity that then used the Roman Empire as a way to evangelize, uh, we know that, for instance, that many of the cities that Rome would set up even in places like Britain, like London or York or Lincoln. These were places that had bishops and had an organized church. And the Romans never conquered uh, Scotland or they never conquered Ireland. So what's interesting is when we look at Celtic spirituality, um, the, the church organized itself and evangelized itself in a very different way because of this kind of um, kind of the way in which uh, Rome was not in, in, involved. Um, and whereas you had um, the Roman em Empire saw its, uh, its capacity to own and control and have authority and dominate over, uh, the Celtic world was much more fluid, nomadic. Um, there's this wonderful phrase from St. Columba of Hospes Mundi, that we are guests of the world. So the idea that the kind of anti-imperial model that we're going to kind of hear about in more depth um, comes about through this kind of primitive beginning of what it, mean, what it meant to be Celtic. Um, the tribes also were able to adapt and assimilate um, with people. And there was a friend of mine once said to me, well, why, why was the Irish, why, we were, why were we never, um, an empire. And I said, because it's basically we were nosy. We just liked finding out how strange people were and we just liked them the way they were. And so the idea of adapting and assimilating for this Celtic community that was a nomadic community, I think has these early, early roots. And a lot of the early beliefs of the Celtic peoples that we're gonna talk about in a minute about Dru Druidism and what the theology that kind of predated Christianity and how those basic Celtic beliefs were then incorporated into Christianity. And basically it was a universalism. It's rather like the, the Hindu idea that God is in all things and Christ, the idea that Christ is in all things. And that what they really did was they took that, that worship of the sun as the energy source of all things. Um, it's a wonderful way to think about the Celtic cross as the Christing of the sun. So all that, all that happened in those early years was the, the many of the practices of loving creation, of seeing God in creation, and of um, worshiping God. For instance, the Druids would worship God in the great oaks. So worship in early Christianity continued outside when the weather was good. And um, so you've got this idea of, of blessing something, of Christianizing something that was already there. So what was the, you know, what was the topography, the like, religious topography like when Christianity began to be talked about in, in the Celtic region? So you had basically lunar and solar festivals marking the sun's path. The, the photograph I'm showing you is of Newgrange or Bruna Boyne, which is a 5,000 year old Irish temple. Uh, not quite sure what it was built for. It was certainly, it was linked to lunar and solar light. Uh, Midsummer, midwinter solstice, midsummer, the light came through that, um, that doorway 
uh, just above the doorway and entered into, a, it's a hundred foot into this, uh, basically it's a pile of stones, like a hill, and would light up the interior of the, of the uh, um, kind of temple. And it was a marker of time. So, so this influenced uh, Christianity in terms of uh, the connection of lunar and solar festivals. Um, in the season of uh, Samen, uh, the beasts gathered and were slaughtered for winter. And it was kind of like the beginning of the new year, like Halloween or All Saints. And this was a time associated with the dead and storytelling and divination, as opposed to Beltane, where the herds are driven out from summer pastures. Uh, May marks the beginning of the summer. We, we talk about May Day. So that has very ancient roots and extending uh, and the clans would gather with their relatives and their friends after it's a bit like after lockdown we we get out and see our family and our friends so uh, Beltane was this uh, wonderful kind of festival of spring and summer and return to enjoy and and the pastures these nomadic people would take their cattle and their sheep out um, and the uh, the feasting was under the uh, the shining one again the sun. I love the carvings. We're, we're not quite sure what the decoration on these. This is the curbstone of Newgrange. Some theories is it's it's tracing the journey of the sun. So again, this importance of worshiping uh, nature and God it is in all infused in all things. So um, beginning of uh, the uh, spring and summer, animals were released through two bonefires um, uh, as a way of maybe disinfecting them and cleansing them after the winter. Uh, some interesting social customs, uh, again, that showed some of the um, influences and the, the practicality of religion, I guess, at this time that divorce was allowed in the season of Beltane. And Lunasa was the time that you could, if you had a wonderful relationship uh, in the summer, you would commit to this person for a year and a day. And, and then it could be longer, but there was a kind of like a trial marriage. So this was built in to the festivals. And both festivals considered the best time to communicate with the other world. When the kind of doors of heaven were said to be open, rather like the way in which we have ha Halloween. It's one of those sort of thin spaces between the dead and the living. And then the other tradition that very much permeated into Celtic spirituality, Christianity, was that men and women could mediate uh, with the gods as could lay and clergy. So these Druidic practices were all in kind of incorporated into uh, Christianity, the early forms of Christianity. And I would say probably before the fifth century that there was probably a Christian presence in Ireland uh, before Patrick. Um, we know that um, the early monastic traditions in Ireland that they would continue to worship in the oak groves that were regarded as sacred women could lead worship. Um, and there is a wonderful complaint in the sixth century by French bishops, the, this strange Irish practice of letting women celebrate the Eucharist. So again, they, had, they were doing their own thing. And this, uh, we've talked about how the cross is incorporated into the honoring and worship of the sun and that how Christ is in all living things, a kind of a form of, um, of pantheism. So there is um, kind of revisiting, there's a lot of mythology and just misinformation about Patrick. And I just wanna kind of put the record straight of kind of where, where I think he belongs. I think he is, he is certainly an important figure in the history of the church. He is known as the apostle of Ireland. Um, we know there's a couple of things that we have some writings by him, his, uh, confession that was later revised and kind of do doctored, but but the the early writings of Patrick are kind of um, rough, kind of uneducated. Um, he is the son of a Roman deacon, so he grew up in England, where there would have been a Roman church. Um, he is kidnapped by Irish pirates, and he's 
When he's 16, he is forced to take care of sheep. He escapes. He has a vision of Christ, not unlike the call of Moses while keeping the sheep. He goes to seminary in Rome, and then he is sent. The date that we know that he arrived in Ireland was the year 432, and he's sent by the Pope. Um, uh, again, the myth is to evangelize the Irish, but some scholars think that there was already a very active church that was not in a line with Rome, and so he was sent to kind of, you know, bring these uh, uh, nasty, horrible, uh, disruptive Christians into line uh, with with Rome. Um, there's also some. Uh, uh, the, we all know the Saint uh, Patrick's breastplate. I bind unto myself today that wonderful invoking of God's uh, God's presence in all things. That that is attributed to him in the fifth century. Um, there is the legend about he drove the snakes out of Ireland, and I told an attorney friend that, no, no, we love attorneys, and we have had attorneys in Ireland all the time, so the, the snakes are still there. Um, and then there is a legend of him um, kind of uh, meeting at this big uh, royal party where the, the bonfire to kick off the summer festival with the High King of Ireland, that there's a story that Patrick uh, uses this and uh, preempts the lighting of the great fire of Tara. And there would have been probably practices like this. I mean, in that story, you have a way in which the older Druidic practices were Christianized. And also many of us who've been to Ireland, we visited Holy Wells. I mean, my, I lived, you know, a couple of miles away from the place where Patrick arrived in Ireland. Uh, there are wells associated with him, uh, healing wells, uh, wells for your eye or your foot, everything. And these were obviously ancient uh, pagan places as well that became Christianized and became as associated with different saints. Um, so imagine people coming then from Asia, Turkey, th through the Alps, going up through Spain, the influence of, of art, when we come to kind of that high period of Celtic art, there is um, there are parallels in art in Spain. So, so the idea, we think that just because we have planes these days that you know people in, in the early centuries didn't get around, they got around. And the, the influence of art and theology and practice and farming and all of that was going on. So people, this, this, Migration um, is something that was very much um, with us back then. So let me, I just wanted to sh sort of share with you, this map shows the extent of the Roman empire. You can see that it doesn't extend north of H Hadrian's wall into Scotland, never extended into um, Ireland. Um, parts of Wales um, also retained language and customs that were Celtic. So the ancient Britons were driven by the Picts in various waves of migration. But you can see the parallel between how the Roman Empire, many cities and roads connected, allowed the way in which evangelism and Christianity could And the uh, waterway, go. yeah could go uh, throughout the empire. Um, so some of the differences in the Celtic uh, way, the Celtic church looked at, um, again, um, the evangel it was not through cities, it was through tribes and uh, kind of nomadic people. Um, uh, this, the Celtic tonsure was that of a slave, which was, if you were a monk, your, your hair was shaved from ear to ear. It was um, a different, the Roman tonsure was at the back so there was a difference in how uh, the, the clergy looked. And even as when Christianity became uh, the state religion, we adopted all the insignia of the, uh, the gentry and the military. So the stoles, the um, chasubles that we wear, all of that comes. And the Celtic tradition was, was much, much simpler and uh, didn't have all of that kind of all the tra trappings of, of power. We saw the founders of the church and the Celtic tradition 
as uh, Mary and the beloved disciple at the foot of the cross. Son, behold your mother, mother, behold your son, and community is created out of suffering. Rather than Peter, here are the keys, the kind of top-down authority model. And then one of the, the big uh, kind of bones of contention was the dating of Easter. Um, that again, that linking of lunar and solar, that the Celtic church had a different way of celebrating and marking Easter. And that was, um, that was uh, contended up until the Synod of Whitby. Whitby's off the coast of Britain, uh, or just on the coast of Britain, a Synod in 664. And then the other, the other um, uh, main difference that I'll explore looking at the teaching of Pelagius is the doctrine of original sin which was only created in the fifth century. And Augustine um, is the leading kind of theologian who promotes that. And, and again, what, um, what the Roman uh, centralized church, have, they have a problem with the Celts who believe that basically you're born morally neutral, you can go uh, good, you can go uh, bad, um, but the idea that somehow you're evil because uh, of the fall and because of, of Adam and Eve and all that, they, they had a hard time with that. So I want to talk about Pelagius because uh, Pelagius, we, we have a lot of Pelagius's writing and this poor, uh, he was um, probably from uh, uh, Celtic Britain. Um, he was certainly, uh, he had lots of followers in Ireland in these remoter parts of the church, but he was a debater, a writer. We, his writing is, is very uh, great high standard. He was a great debater. Um, and we get, uh, through his writings, um, we get this connection between what was, the, what was the contention between the Celtic community and Rome. And, and this, this idea of, of original sin um, is, is really important. And I just wanted to outline, here's, here's a kind of just a taste of the kind of theology that Pelagius had. He is a Christian who shows compassion to all, who was not at all provoked by wrong done to him, who does not allow the poor to be oppressed in his presence, who helps the wretched, who succors the needy, who mourns with the mourners, who feels in others' pain, as if it were his own, and so on. So I've listed some of the um, well-known books that he um, uh, Pelagius wrote, and unfortunately, um, his teaching is uh, regarded as heresy, and he ends up in exile in Africa. Um, and he's he's kind of a, almost like a parable of what is going to happen to this this embracing, loving. Christianity that is slowly being strangled by the imperial Roman model that wants to control, wants uniformity, wants uniformity of theology and of liturgy and practice and so on. So I, I'm a great fan of Pelagius. I think I'm probably a Pelagian uh, at heart. Um, one of the things I liked about his teaching uh, was um, he would take the great commandment to love God love your neighbor as you love yourself. And he added, and to love your enemy. And I'm sure that didn't go down well in the Imperial Roman Church uh, at the time. So this is a little segment of his teaching on sin. It was because God wished to bestow on the rational creature the gift of doing good of his own free will and the capacity to exercise free choice by implanting in man the possibility of choosing either alternative, he could not claim to possess the good of his own volition unless he was the kind of creature that could also have possessed evil. Our most excellent creator wished us to be able to do either, but actually to do only one, that is good, which he also commanded, giving us the capacity to do evil only so our own, so that we might do his will by exercising our own. That being so, this very capacity to do evil is also good, good, I say, because it makes the good part better by making it voluntary and independent, not bound by necessity, but free to decide for itself. So here's a, a painting of 
of uh, poor Pelagius debating his uh, wonderful theology with St. Augustine, um, who wins the day, and his theology of original sin became a, a church doctrine. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, the liturgical practices of the faithful go on. And this is a wonderful uh, page from a, the uh, Stau Missal, which is one of the, again, an example of um, illustrated, um, sometimes it's the scriptures or the Bible, but this would be a, a liturgical uh, a, a liturgical book that would have been used in, in a monastery or churches. And we have, um, uh, I just wanted to read you, there's a, a wonderful Eucharistic chant from the Stowe Missal that I wanted uh, to read for you. We believe, O Lord, we believe that in this breaking of your body and pouring out of your blood, we become redeemed people. We confess that by our sharing of this sacrament, we are strengthened to endure in hope until we lay hold and enjoy its true fruits in the heavenly places. So there were different liturgical practices. Uh, mass was offered on Sundays and Thursdays in the great festivals. Penance was required for people who weren't at church. Uh, there was weekly reception of the Eucharist. There was a seven year preparation for monastics. Um, there was this wonderful relationship that you would have with another uh, brother or sister, a confessor known as your soul friend, Kana Aram, Kara Ama Aram. And then um, they loved reading uh, John's gospel and the epistles, the divine office, eight services a day. And there were different forms of prayer. There was this uh, form of prayer in the form of a cross standing prayers for the dead were offered, and then special prayers that had uh, meaning and protection. Um, so the Stow Missal is a great example of liturgical practices uh, in the ninth century. I want to talk a little bit about the monastic community because this is a big part of Irish and Celtic uh, Christianity. You see this is a medieval uh, drawing of, um, this would have been the closest thing to a town or a city. You'd have the, um, the brothers or sisters living in these little huts and you'd have a, a large building where there'd be a church. You notice the round tower. Um, uh, this community was largely pacifist and the way that it dealt with raids when people would come and invade like the Vikings, they would just go into their round tower and they'd pull up the ladder and they'd have supplies in there and they'd just kind of, you know, sit it out until they got tired and went home. Um, and then around it, you have the farms and you would have uh, people living maybe to help help the community. So this would have been a kind of um, a model mo monastic uh, community. Some of the stonework is, th this is uh, beehives that are on Skellig Michael, which is an island off the West Coast, remote islands, like the Egyptian um, hermits often, uh, sometimes the monastics would live together and sometimes they would they would live on isolated communities. So these are these kind of beehive stone huts that have these beautiful corbel stones uh, that are with us. And I want to I want to give an example of a couple of the Irish saints and Columba is um, uh, one of the people that uh, is certainly he was of, of royal blood and uh, his his family were the O'Neills of Ulster. He, he gave up that kind of privilege and became a monastic. And um, he studied, many of these early saints would study under a, a saint. So he studied under St. Finian. There was an abbey at Moville. And, um, and then there was this tradition in the, the Celtic church of red martyrdom that if you, if you, um, you know, were martyred, uh, the, the, there was red martyrdom if you died for your faith. But there was this thing called white martyrdom, where if you had to, if you felt a call, you would leave your home and your kindred, and you would often set sail in a little boat. Sometimes you would do it alone, or sometimes you would do it with companions. And the white martyrdom was trusting God, that God would take you to where, um, 
God wants you to be. And I've talked in my sermons about the tradition of um, looking for heaven and looking for the place where you were going to die, because that is the doorstep of heaven. So a lot of the this tradition of Columba, and I was thinking about that, what on earth is that about? And what I admire about this community is they were facing their anxieties, you know? I mean, here we are and we have so much and yet we are so worried and frightened about everything. We are a very anxious society. And what I think the Celtic tradition can teach us as a way of kind of leaning into our fears. I mean, the fear of leaving home, uh, not having anything to provide, going out on the ocean, and then ending up in these strange lands that, you know, God is kind of connecting you with, with uh, different folks. So he sets off with uh, 12 companions and he leaves Ireland and he finds an island off the coast of Scotland called Iona. And he establishes a community there. And this is the beginning of these little monks that start finding these little tiny um, abbeys and priories uh, that then become within one or two centuries will become the centers of scholarship and learning. And when Europe enters the dark ages, it is these little communities that then bring teaching and learning and all of the things that have kind of been forgotten in uh, main, mainland Europe um, that they come back in again with the Christian message. One of these islands I love, this is Linda's farm, um, which is in Northumbria, the northern part of England. It has a causeway, the water goes out, you can drive on the ocean to get to the island, and then, you, then the water comes back on and the island is isolated. So this has been a monastic community for a long, long time. Um, it was founded in, in 634 uh, by St. Aidan. And um, the priory, uh, the ruins of the priory is still there. There's still a, a wonderful church. And these little communities like Iona and Linda's Farm are going, they're, they're principally places of prayer and study. And they, the monks would write out the gospels and usually using the Vulgate. And, and they would il illustrate these gospels, these beautiful books. And the Book of Kells, um, some of you have been to Trinity College Dublin, where uh, the Book of Kells is kept. Um, it would have been, um, it, it would have been made in, I mean, there's actually four copies. There, there are copies of the gospel. So at Trinity College, they, they have always one on show, but there's actually four volumes and I, I got to meet a great privilege when I was living in California. I got to meet the, um, the librarian of Trinity um, that was there in the 50s when they cleaned it. And so I got to hear all the stories of, of how they have preserved this amazing, this treasure. Um, and what you're seeing is in this cover is the symbol of the four evangelists uh, in one of the, uh, the, the, the books. Um, so this is an example of this really high form of art that came out of these monastic communities and uh, again would have would have gone uh, around the around the uh, not around the world necessarily but around the world of its day of of uh, Europe. Columbanus, uh, again a later saint, 543 to 613. Um, he I love this story about him that he was really hot. He was so hot that the girls uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't keep their hands off him. And so he had, to, he had to get out of town. And so he left with his companions, uh, became a monk and uh, went off and, and uh, became famous in Europe. But I love this quote, Columbanus's fine figure, his splendid color and his noble manliness made him beloved by all. And therein lay the problem. He aroused the lust of lascivious maidens especially of those whose fine figure and superficial beauty are wont to enkindle mad desire in the minds of wretched men. Um, this, uh, I love this, uh, this window. This is a, a window made by Harry Clark, who 
has made extraordinary Irish stained glass, um, beautiful uh, beginning of the 20th century. So I use this as um, an illustration of St. Columbanus. Um, he studied at Bangor um, in Northern Ireland, which is very near again where I grew up. There's an abbey still in, in uh, Bangor. And then um, uh, a little insight into life. Um, uh, the, some of the rules of the monastic community. Uh, if you were wanting to hit somebody, you had to uh, fast uh, 40 days on bread and water. And, and you actually hit someone and draw blood. It meant that you had penance for three years. And even speaking ill of the rules meant exile from the community. Um, here's a map of those little islands, uh, those little communities that the Irish monks would have uh, uh, sailed off from. And then on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see these communities that these monks and, and uh, sisters also went forth and founded. So pretty amazing. Um, the, the last saint I want to talk about is Brendan the Navigator, um, who lived uh, 46 to 577. And he was ordained uh, at 26 by a priest, uh, by a, ordained a priest by Eric, who would have been a bishop. And then afterwards, he founds a number. He's got this kind of wanderlust. And he founds uh, uh, some communities in the Aran Islands off the coast of Ireland and then off uh, Argyle. And then he goes off to uh, Wales. And then he goes to Brittany. And then he has this extraordinary journey that's written about in uh, this book. And there is a theory that Brendan and this community actually reached America. And I remember in a parish I worked in Dublin, there was a member of the congregation who I think in 1977, there's a picture, they actually created a boat uh, based, it was built of reeds. They built this boat and it actually sailed um, from Ireland to, to America to prove that this could be done. And, National Geographic had it on its cover. Um, and it, this story of Brendan, this uh, navigator, um, especially in the medieval period, they loved the idea of adventure and all of the exotic things. And it was like, it was about the spiritual journey uh, that we're all in, we're all in this journey together and we're trying to um, find our way and find heaven and uh, find the perfect you know, place where there's no illness. So the idea of this adventure to find heaven um, really fuels, it, it comes from this Celtic tradition and the medieval period, they just love it, um, this, this uh, wonderful stuff. So let me kind of conclude and then we can open it up for, for questions about what can we learn from um, these um, little snippets and these people. First of all, that Christianity even though Christianity has assimilated, it has many, many different forms. And even at attempts when there's um, a centralized authority that's trying to control everything, you still have these little pockets of resistance that remain true to their beliefs and their customs. And this is, uh, this for the Celtic church, um, I mean, in some ways, the Synod of Whitby in, in the seventh century was the, was the kind of final battle between the Imperial Roman Church and the, the, the organized Celtic Church. And after the Synod of Whitby, um, it declined. It kind of went off and, and Rome uh, became the Imperial Church and kind of uh, took over. Some of the things that endure, however, this idea of trusting in God working on overcoming our anxieties and our fears, um, believing that God and Christ are in all living things, that all of life as we know it is sacred, and how that influences uh, the way we live, uh, our connection to each other, um, the inspiration that we find in art, literature, and travel. And then also, I think at a time, you know, we look at I look at um, the news and I see migration. I see people who are moving from um, 
places where there's conflict or whatever. And I realized that this isn't the first time uh, this has happened to the human family. And that in many ways, God is working in this wonderful kind of melting pot that we are. And the, the, the Celtic traditions show us that, that this, um, this journeying together is a sacred trust um, and that we should embrace it, maybe look at it differently and so on. So let me stop there. And we have about 10 minutes, I think, um, for comments or questions. I'm going to stop my screen share and uh, we can go back to our um, our boxes. So there we are. Albert, do you know anything of, I once had a conversation um, with Cliff when I was first exploring Episcopal church and um, cause I had been to another um, Episcopal church and I was shocked by how many Celtic crosses there were in their graveyard. And his contention was that the lineage of the Episcopal Church took on the Celtic Church rather than the Roman Church. Is, do you know anything of that? I think the, there's, there's a kind of Anglican spin that, um, that history doesn't necessarily um, uh, endorse. And I think, uh, I mean, there's a kind of Victorian romanticism. There was a lot of writing done around, especially, I mean, the, the Church of Ireland where I grew up is full of that, but historically it's not true. I think, I mean, what, what happened in the Reformation was basically, in, in certainly in England, that all of the bishops were Roman Catholic. The church was Roman Catholic. And then on a dime, they became Protestants. So it wasn't that they were all fired and Henry got a whole load of new bishops. They all moved from, um, you know, their, their uh, connection to Rome. And all of a sudden that connection uh, changed to Henry was now head of the church. Mm -hmm. So the idea, and then the Protestant, the Anglican church then continued from there. So we would say that the, apostolic succession continued in in the line of the bishops and that was so in Ireland as well as in in Britain um, but there's a lot of romanticism about the Celtic stuff that uh, I mean I think we we still uh, struggle with being an imperial church you know and that is with us and and the Celtic if we really if we were in um, in fellowship and in connection with that, we wouldn't be doing all this imperial stuff we've been doing. So to claim that we're somehow, you, you know, we're not the imperial church is just not true. Oh, I was going to say, just interesting that, you know, Philly being the Quaker city that influences from course, the anti authoritarian the anti-centralized institution. I mean, it, it, it's was part of coming out of the Reformation, the anti-Catholic, anti-papal. I mean, that it's just, it's funny that I get strained this through various cultures, various religions, the anti-authoritarian that the Irish had. I mean, I guess I just also wonder about the Irish Catholic day and, you know, like the, the uh, you know, all these about what they did, babies, un you know, the, the, there was a lot of listening to authority. <laughs> the Catholic Church in Ireland has has posed its authority over people, and I don't know how the Celtic tradition survived there. You might have thought that. I don't... Yeah, yeah, and I think uh, it's 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 very interesting because the reaction. I mean, um, R Rosemary knows this as well because of her connections with Ireland. But you know, in our lifetime, you went from a a, a, a theocracy, the island of Ireland was either um, evangelical Protestant theocracy in the North, which was very strict Sabbatarianism and, uh, and very dour theology, very kind of Presbyterian uh, Calvinist. And in the Republic, you had um, very Catholic, no abortion, no contraception, mixed marriages were, you know, for, and then you had to promise that kids would be brought up Catholic 
and that that had a huge effect. So you had you had a theocratic um, authoritarianism that the Irish have rejected totally, and and the the, the clergy sexual abuse the recent decision to um, allow abortion, to allow uh, same gender marriages. So the, so the church has um, in Ireland and also the church of Ireland th that I was ordained in is also very conservative. Um, so people are just saying, this isn't, this isn't Christianity. This isn't something we wanna be a part of. Um, so there is, um, there is a, a reaction and it's largely around social issues as it is in Europe. I mean, I think John Paul II was trying to, within the European constitution, get the Roman Catholic Church recognized as the state church of Europe. And it was on issues of women's rights and issues of human sexuality. The church, um, if the church had been more open, it would have been accepted as the, the European, the kind of state church. But most Europeans couldn't, um, couldn't stomach the, the, the Catholic Church's um, teaching. I know he was trying to get state church. So <laughs> I passed the baton to somebody else's question, but fascinating. Yeah. Rosemary, you had another question? Are you familiar with the Sheila and the Gig? Um, I've heard about the Sheila and the Gig. Tell me, remind me. It's from the Druids, it's before, and there there's some churches you can go to, and it's actually a female with an open vulva and it's over the top of the entrance to the old Celtic church and people would rub it for fertility. It's very well known down south near Cork. There's several churches who still have them. Well, we wouldn't have that in East Belfast, I tell you. <laughs> we wouldn't allow that at all. That's just nasty. <laughs> We'd probably put a bikini on her. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, okay. No, we have lots of problems around. I mean, uh, again, the, the church is, you know, we're, we're sexually very damaged. Um, and, and how do we heal that, um, the, 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 you know, the effect of sexism on the church? And, um, you know, we're seeing all this playing out in the secular world now. Um, the, the Me Too movement, uh, all of that. Uh, people are saying we can't we can't condone this kind of behavior anymore mm -hmm. and uh, so so the church has is responsible I think for a lot of the damage and how do we heal that but I think in in the Celtic tradition fertility sexuality and our connection to the earth was something that grounded us in God and how do we reclaim that how can that influence the way we think certainly when I look at uh, some of the prayer books around the New Zealand prayer book that's been influenced by Maori. So, so these older like Native American traditions uh, have a deep spirituality that grounds us in the earth. And I think are much healthier than um, a lot of the stuff that medieval and Victoriana did to us. Anyone else doesn't have a question. Is it true then Jansenism came over and this was a big change in how Dow, you know, the strictness Jansenism came from France over to Ireland and the last, since the fifties, it was quite severe in Catholic churches where they really believed the body was evil. And there would be like eight day retreats where the ministers, my, my uh, granny Coyle used to tell me stories about how severe the rulings were. Do you, are you familiar with that? I'm, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with that, but I, I can imagine uh, there, there, is, there is something in um, the, the Irish kind of um, religious practice that's quite severe. And if you think of, of pilgrimage up Croke Patrick where people do it on their knees and there's a, there's a kind of, um, there's a sadism almost in, in connecting one's own sufferings or sacrifice. Um, so that is very much a part of the traditions of the Celtic community where, I mean, you'd have prayers attributed to Patrick where he would be standing in ice cold water reciting the Psalms. So it's that kind of ascetic tradition 
um, which, um, you know, if, if I could just about survive a winter in Philadelphia at that suffering. You know, I'm not going to stand in a river and saying my prayers. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, life is life is uh, is to be lived, um, but that you know that's a part of it, and and how they, again, but maybe it's about that you lean into your fear, you lean in a way in which you heal anxiety by uh, embracing this part of you. Mm. Have any of you? I know George is being well, so also Ireland. The Rosemary has been, have any others been to the Celtic regions? Madeline, no. Meg, you have, where, where did you visit? We went to, my mom, brother and sister and I went after my dad had died. Um, and we flew into Dublin, but we traveled for about 10 days all through Northern Ireland. Ended up in a, the Northern part of Northern Ireland, Ireland is, um, and it, I've, it's, I've never seen such beauty. It, the, oh, stunning. I loved it. And it wasn't raining. <laughs> no, it actually wasn't. We yeah, got very little. We had very little rain. I remember a flight from uh, London to Shannon, and as we were going over those wonderful green fields that you're describing, mm -hmm. uh, the whole plane burst into clapping. And I said, "What's going on?" You know, and they said, "This is the first time we've seen the sun all all year." Um, uh, so yeah, it is. It's beautiful when it when the sun shines, and you have these very magical places. I mean, mm. that, that you know, I've come to appreciate these ancient places of prayer mm -hmm. and healing mm -hmm. and it's connected to the land and the people yeah. and uh, there's a kind of deep um deep soul and and a deep sadness i mean a lot of the a lot of what um the celtic peoples have been through um including scotland and wales you know the abuse of uh, they weren't able to use their language they weren't able mm -hmm. to to you know so there's the, part of that imperial Im imposition has wounded many of these places. So they are beautiful, but there's a kind of there's a kind of tragic woundedness about uh, about it as well. Leon Uris one wrote a beautiful book, A Terrible Beauty, mm -hmm. and it talks about the, the the woundedness and how it occurred. Yep. Yeah. So anyway, but I have to go and uh, say my prayers. And uh, but thank you all for um, sitting in on this uh, talk that we, has been in the making for about a year, Charlotte. Right? We've tried to do this, and I kept getting bumped by other things. But I'm very happy to share it. And to say that it, you know this the Celtic piece of um, I love this part of that shaped me, and uh, mm -hmm. and it's nice to be able to share this with you. So hope you have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.